Kisumi from Kisumi. We will talk on curve KK categories one and two. Thanks for the introduction and for the invitation. I'll be talking about some joint work with uh, Matt Hogenkamp, who will be giving talk two today. And I'm talking about, uh, we have a series of papers together, and I'm talking about papers one and two, which uh, exist more or less. They're um, in decent shape. Matt's going to be talking about paper three, which doesn't really exist yet. The main statement that I want to explain to you is this part in italics. So let me explain. Take a, um, let's say, a, a connected complex reductive group G, and consider also the Langlands dual G check. Now to each one, you can um, associate its Hecke category, which is a, let's say for us, a triangulated monoidal category. And the main statement is a Langlands reconstruction of a sort. It says that the Hecke category of G and G check know each other. And it, it, they do so in kind of a striking way. You take the Hecke category of one, take um, a special object, a causal complex, which is an algebra object in this monoidal category, and look at the category of uh, the derived category of bimodules over it. And that gives you the Langlands dual Hecke category. This duality is a reinterpretation and an extension of something called monoidal causal duality uh, for the Hecke category, which I uh, studied previously with Achara, Rish, and Williamson. And this reinterpretation is actually motivated by uh, curved causal duality. So I'll get to that. And also um, something called the box tensor product of uh, type DA A infinity by modules. So I need to tell you what I mean actually by the Hecke category. Here's the Hecke algebra. It's got a standard basis, delta W, Kajan Lustig, BW. I think we're okay. I'll come back to this in a little bit for the normalization. And so in Ben Webster's talk yesterday, we already saw this kind of thing. Take a, a connected reductive group over C or even katz moody group G and uh, Borel and Max, Max Torres B and T. And I allow myself uh, any field of coefficients K. Um, it can even sometimes be characteristic too, but Let's not concern ourselves too much with that. Our story is going to be pretty general. And then on the flag variety G mod B, you have a, still a Borel action on the left, and you can consider either B equivariant, the right category of sheaves of K vector spaces, or B constructible. What's this? The former is a monoidal category under convolution. The latter is not monoidal, but it's a module category over this. And you have a forgetful functor from Borel equivariant to just Borel constructible. So I'm using this tacky notation G mod B mod B. I'll just read it as a BGB. And it's going to be useful for what follows. Okay. So from this notation, you see how BGB acts on the right of UGB. U is a unipotent radical, but uh, I'm actually not going to be working with it so much. Just think of it as notation for Borel constructible. Now inside here, we have to find the additive Hecke category, parity complexes, Borel equivariant or constructible. And well, you can um, pretend whenever I say parity complexes, you can just replace those words with Zorgo bimodules and you'll be totally fine for the entirety of this talk. To go between the two, so this was already in Ben's talk yesterday. You note that the Borel equivariant cohomology of a point is a polynomial ring. Let's call that R. And then you take uh, hypercohomology. Any sheaves on this space uh, will become an R bimodule. There are indecomposable objects in this category of parity complexes called EW, again labeled by uh, biogroup elements W, and those correspond exactly to the unicomposable Zorgel bimodules BW. Okay, so this is a, a monoidal additive category, and it categorifies the Hecke algebra. So does this one, but only as a, a module over itself. So this is a right Hecke algebra as a right regular module. 
this left quotient, I called it, uh, also has an interpretation in terms of Zorgol bimodules. But what you do is you start with Zorgol bimodules, which is an R bimodule, and you kill the action of uh, all the higher degree polynomials on the left. And this corresponds, again, to the fact that unlike here, where you have both a B and a B on the left and right, you only have one on the right now. So you've killed the torus action on the left. Okay, now you pass to complexes. So the objects of these categories, called uh, mixed derived categories, is a complex of parity complexes, or a complex of Zorgol bimodules or Zorgol modules. And that means that they have, these categories have two grading shifts, one from parity complexes or uh, the grading shift of Zorgol bimodules, and one from uh, taking complexes of those. So this kind of having two gradings is uh, supposed to imitate what, what happens in um, elatic sheaves, mixed elatic sheaves. And this by grading is going to be um, essential for this causal duality stories that follows. So in these triangulate categories, we have objects like uh, the Rookie complexes, standards and co-standards, forward and, and backward Rookie complexes that categorify uh, the standard basis elements. Now I want to get the cogent duality. At the Hecke algebra level, this is just a ring involution of the Hecke algebra. And on generators, it's defined by sending a standard basis to itself and the parameter V to minus V inverse. Now let's look at the relations again. So I've written this in this symmetric looking way. So we can see from here that if I fix the standards, but send V to minus V inverse, this exchanges these two factors. And of course, this is all fixed. So it preserves the relations. And so it does give you a ring map, in fact, a, a ring involution. And this is not the Kajanalistic uh, involution because it, it doesn't fix the Kajanalistic basis. Instead, for example, BS or a simple reflection S gets sent to this TS, which has this expression in terms of um, Kajanalistic basis. Okay, so a natural question, can you categorify this? Well, at the level of the additive Hecke category, you can't because there's some minus signs, but you can always pass the complexes to deal with that. And so you're looking for a triangulated monoidal auto equivalence of G mix VGB or uh, complexes of Zorgo bimodules categorifying this involution. And the behavior of this uh, desired equivalence with shifts is reminiscent of a phenomenon called causal duality in homological algebra. So we call this uh, causal duality. But it turns out that um, there are some computations you can do to convince yourself very easily that there is no such uh, auto equivalence. To get one, you have to do two things. First of all, you have to introduce a Langlands dual, G check, and consider not the monoidal category, but just the, the, the regular representation of it. So you have D mix UGB, or it's complex of Zorgo modules for both G and G check. And now there's some triangulated equivalence relating these two that preserve the standards and sends these are indecomposable parity complexes, which uh, categorify the Kajan-Lustig or P-canonical basis in positive characteristic and relates them to what are called indecomposable tilting perverse sheaves. And this duality, I think, is really uh, fundamental and, and important to representation theory. This category D mix UGB, you can think of as, for example, when G is finite type and K is the complex numbers, this is the bounded derived category of uh, uh, the corresponding BGG category O for the Lie algebra. And, and then this duality really is the causal self-duality of uh, Benz and Ginsburg's orgle. Well, that composed with the Ringel self-duality. 
Now, or you can take G to be the loop group of some other reductive group, take K to be uh, FP, then this category is related to modular representation theory of that reductive group. And so this causal duality in that setting played a role in the Reese Williamson conjecture for um, characters of tilting modules. Monoidal causal duality is uh, something that we use to, to, to show this uh, non-monoidal causal duality. And here's one way to motivate it. So this kappa is the causal duality that, duality that we want. We know, for example, on this D mix UGB, that there is an action of the, or well, even D mix BGB, but let's just take the additive category uh, by convolution on the right. But if you believe in causal duality, then there should be an additional action. Here's the additive Hecke category for the Langlands dual, which acts on the left of this category, but via kappa, it should also act on the left of D mix UGB. Okay, so uh, you can dream that there is some monoidal category here and here, which completes this diagram. So for instance, this category should be some monoidal additive category, just like the Hecke category. It should be defined still in terms of the group G as opposed to Langlands dual G check, but this category should be equivalent to the Langlands dual Hecke category. Okay. Causal duality is um, a, sp a special case of uh, symplectic duality, which we've heard about already in this conference. And um, in that setting, there's a bijection of what are called twisting and shuffling in the functors on uh, category O, the derived category of category O. And there's actually a, a categorification of that. So on, this is uh, our version of the derived category of category O. And on the right and the left, there are twisting and shuffling functors, but in this special case, they can actually be upgraded to action of a whole monoidal category. And then some objects in this category acting on this will give you these functors. Actually for that, you need to pass to uh, complexes of parity complexes, but uh, let me stick to the additive case here. Okay, and uh, in uh, previous work, we, uh, we found exactly such a monoidal category. And this is a, an anal analog of a construction by Dezrakovnikov and Yun in characteristic zero. In that case, they really found some um, definition, some monoidal category of uh, mixed elastic sheaves on UGU, um, use a unipotent radical. And now it's monoidal under uh, U convolution and acts on the left by U convolution. Again, I'm using the stacking notation to help. For us, that wasn't possible in positive characteristic coefficients. And so what we did was some algebraic analog of this construction. U never actually played a role for us. And anyway, we had this additive monoidal category tilt sitting inside a triangulated category, D mix U G U, completing this diagram. And that's how we actually proved this equivalence in the middle. So I, without getting too much into it, here's the definition of uh, this category D mix UGU in our algebraic version. And I just want you to just get a sense of uh, what it's like without understanding all the uh, details. So here's some algebras. R is the same polynomial ring from before that shows up in Zorgel bimodules. Let's take a basis uh, just for simplicity and uh, look at it as a polynomial ring in X1 through XR. Now I introduce an exterior algebra and corresponding variables, odd variables, theta one through theta R. Then this K is the causal resolution of the trivial R module. I also want an, a, a kind of dual polynomial algebra in variables y1 through yr. And then here's the definition. A free monogamic complex is, a complex is, well, it's not quite a complex. It's a 
a, a sequence of parity complexes together with a differential which is allowed to have some thetas and some y's on the left and right. And it satisfies not delta squares equal to zero, but this funny condition, which you can think of as some curvature condition. On the right hand side, this is some um, central element, degree two element. And you can think of this definition as uh, describing some uh, curved complexes. So here are some pictures. For example, in this left object, ignore all of these arrows on the, on the right. Then what you have is just a, a Rukia complex. So imagine this is BS to R shifted by one in Zorgo bimodules language. But uh, the free monogamy counterpart has a bunch of additional arrows. I haven't explained all the notation, but for example, this arrow going backward is, well, there is a component that's classical, just the map from uh, R to BS in Zorgo bimodule language, but also there is some, some Y variable here, alpha S check. And if you look at these self loops, there are some odd variables showing up on the left and also some uh, dual polynomial variables showing up on the right. So I don't want to say too much more about this, but the, the philosophy again is this language reconstruction that I, uh, that I um, said in the very beginning. You should think of this as saying, well, this funny construction is something that you can do starting with the Hecke category. And so in, in a completely formal way, you recover from the Hecke category, this new category tilt, which happens to be equivalent as a monoidal category to the Langlands dual Hecke category. That's quite striking. Now, when we wrote these, um, um, that paper, we actually didn't care about this category UGU, free monogamy complexes. In the end, we just really wanted to establish this equivalence in the middle. Right? That's where all the representation theoretic information was. So this UGU was a, just a tool for us. And so many of the constructions there are kind of ad hoc. Actually, I didn't tell you anything about this convolution product, which is the monoidal structure on UGU. And this is hard. I mean, we describe it in kind of an ad hoc way. And well, one of the basic things you should check if it's going to be a monoidal structure is the exchange law for a monoidal category. And, and this took a lot of work, a lot of uh, concrete calculations. It, it just doesn't seem to be the right proof. We didn't understand what this really was. There's some subtlety also that uh, made it not as easy. This exchange law really only holds up to homotopy. This category, uh, UGU, is uh, really just the, homolo the homology category of a DG category. And at the DG level, this exchange law fails. Okay, a little bit early, early but uh, here's a summary of what happened. Maybe I can come back to the slide. And we're actually at the break. Okay, let me go on and um, start to motivate the new stuff with math. Let's take GL2. So R is a polynomial ring in X and one, X1 and X2. Here's the causal complex. Well, as a, um, as a complex of R, R modules, it's just R bimodules, it's, sorry, uh, it, it's, it's, as a complex of R modules, it's just a bunch of copies of R, okay? And I've labeled the copies by uh, the exterior algebra. So you see odd variables theta one and theta two. I haven't written the differentials, but uh, you know what they are. Now, if I replace every, every single R with this indecomposable parity complex. So this is the uh, indecomposable parity complex labeled by the identity element of the bio group. So it corresponds to the Zorgo bimodule R. Okay, so I'm just replacing R with R. Then all these differentials also are just multiplication by elements of R. And so they still make sense as 
uh, morphisms of Zorro bimodules. Okay, so in that way, I can regard K as, let's call it bold K, as a complex of parity complexes, as an object of this triangulated Hecke category. And because the, the causal complex was actually um, an algebra, it was a DG algebra, this bold K is an algebra object in this monoidal category. And this is very nice because if you have an algebra object, you can talk about modules over it. So here's what we do. Let's take uh, an object F in DMX BGB. So this is a complex of parity complexes and just convolve it on the left with K. Now that's uh, a kind of a free left K module. But now I add some new differential delta. So this is the word twisted. And to, to ask that this new differential actually, this additional differential actually makes this whole thing into a, a complex again, you need to require the Cartan-Mara equation. Okay, somehow instead of saying delta squares equal to zero, you need to take, in, take into account the already existing differential on uh, K and F, okay, and you end up with this, equa this equation. So this is our definition of a uh, um, D mix UGB, but now with a bold backslash uh, here. And compare that to the old definition of D mix UGB. This was just complexes of uh, B constructible parity complexes okay, or zorgo modules. And because the causal complex is a resolution of uh, the trivial module, this new UGB is gonna be equivalent to the old UGB. The way you should think about this is that the passage from Zorgo bimodules to Zorgo modules is given by uh, tensoring on the left with a trivial module, okay. But instead of doing this, you can tensor with the resolution, the causal resolution, and you get an equivalent category, but uh, one that has a, a richer DG structure. So at, at this point, you can ask, well, th this idea so far um, using the causal resolution was already implicit in um, the earlier work uh, in AMRW. So you can dream at this point, can you just define UGU in a similar way as uh, bimodules over K in the Hecke algebra? And well, we thought about something like this um, also in, in, uh, in the previous work, but it, it just doesn't work. You can, you can compute some homes and, and see that it's not the right category. But here's the fix. Uh, the dream now is that you can say a derived category of K bimodules. And if you can make sense of this, then, then maybe this is UGU. The derived category is, um, it's only a, um, it's, it's an ordinary category. It's not a DG category. And you can think of it, um, you can give it multiple DG models. So the, the easiest one, how do you usually define the derived category? Well, you can take, uh, you can resolve everything by, by, you can resolve everything by free K by modules. But in that case, the monoidal identity, the monoidal unit, which is the regular by module, is not a free K by module. So that also needs to be resolved. And you see there's a difficulty in trying to make this into a monoidal DG category. And because you took this resolution, this category is now only uh, unital up to homotopy. Here's a, another DG model. Uh, there's a, a model of A infinity by modules called type DA structure or type DA bimodules. This is due to Lipschitz, Ospas, and Thurston in their work on uh, border Hager flow homology. And it turns out that in that world, the uh, unit object really is unital uh, at the DG level, whereas this product, the box tensor product is only bifunctorial up to homotopy. So this is uh, reminiscent of uh, the situation that we saw already in the original definition of free monogamy complexes. And there are further hints that uh, these two definitions should be related. In the AMRW definition of uh, um, free monogamy complexes, this 
dual polynomial ring R check uh, appeared almost out of nowhere. But um, there's a really nice explanation for it in terms of derived K bimodules. When you resolve the regular bimodule K by free K bimodules, this R check naturally shows up. Actually, what shows up is the dual of R check. R check is a polynomial algebra. And so this dual is a divided powers co-algebra. This apparently goes back to Cartan. In the AMRW definition of free monogamy complexes, the right action was expressed using some dual polynomial ring R check. And there was some curvature involved. This was, uh, let me go back. This definition. A free monogamy complex is some curved complex with this curvature. Whereas if you consider A infinity bimodules, then what's acting on the right is not our check, but the bar construction of K. So you should allow not only multiplication by uh, all variable thetas, but also by a bunch of them. There are some higher multiplications. And it turns out that these two co-algebras, the divided powers co-algebra dual to R check and the bar construction are related by some sort of weak equivalence. There's a story of uh, what's called curved causal duality. There's a curved causal duality between the causal complex K and some uh, curved divided powers co-algebra. So that's what I want to uh, explain after the break. Any questions so far? I can put up this and so later on there's a summary but sorry I don't have the dream on here. Oh, this is good. We'll be back at um, 8.32 and in the meantime please ask your questions. Um, Mackie? Yeah. Uh, what do you what do you mean by bar construction? Yeah, I will say something about uh, that later on. Um, let's see. So here's the definition of the bar construction. If you have an algebra A, then for, um, you, maybe ignore the uh, A plus. If you just have an algebra A, then you can form the tensor algebra on A. Uh, forget the algebra structure and you put this differential uh, alternating sum of uh, nearby multiplication. This is the kind of thing that you use to, to you can use to um, resolve any module over A, the bar resolution. So there's some version of this. Um, if you want to describe what uh, an A infinity A module is, you have to say not only how A acts, but also how two elements from A act, three elements from A act, and so on. And you can encode the, uh, the axioms for what it means to have for this action to be uh, an A infinity module in terms of uh, the differential of this bar complex and also the coalgebra structure. Hi, Maki. Uh, I, I have a question. Yeah. Can, I, can I have a question about the, yeah. the cur curvatures? All of these curvatures yeah. you write, they actually lift, you can lift them to this uh, uh, G, to the, this to, you know, the curvatures are in terms of this X and Ys, but actually they are lifts of some kind of uh, natural expressions on, uh, on the groups, mod, uh, mod B and so on and so on. So and, you know, all of these curve categories, they're just category of matrix factorizations. Now. And there, this duality is kind of almost obvious what you're talking about. Is it somehow, um, um, I'm just wondering how it's all related to this thing. So we wrote yeah, it should be related to, it. Yeah, it should be related to your story. Um, I mean. But I guess your story is also its characteristic P. That's kind of interesting because, you know, we definitely mm -hmm. haven't looked at that. That would be interesting to see how. How yeah. what survives in characteristic P on our side too. Like so. the, the I mean, so this Y X duality really is uh is not formal at all. Like it 
it really requires passage to Langlands dual. So right. in in characteristic P, you like type B go to type C, and uh, um, and, and like the only way that uh, we know how to prove it is by um, actually um, describing this monoidal functor by generators and relations. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, so uh, yeah, the the, um, the monoidal closed duality phenomenon for the Hecke category really seems to be something. Uh, it's it's not just like some homological algebra. And then there's, there's a separate thing, um, switching between these Y description and uh, um, the description involving theta, that's, uh, that's purely homological algebra. I mean, it's, it's complicated, but it's, uh, it's this curved, um, it's this curved causal duality business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's kind of cool because our, our story is only in Taipei. We don't see any Langlands duality per se, mm. so it would be kind of cool to see. Right, yeah. Thing. Yeah. Is there a, a degree shift in this duality where you're changing the degrees of the generators at all? Yes, they, uh, yeah, so the, um, yeah, so all of these categories have two grading shifts. Okay, so there's um, a grading shift internal to a parity, yeah. and there's a, a new one here. And you can combine them to make this new shift. It's called tape twist. And this duality will exchange tape twist with the shift. Do you, do you see anywhere, do you see something like a Poincaré duality on, on these varieties showing up or any suggestion of such a thing? Poincaré duality. I mean, that's there too, right? I mean, so is there some, I mean, this acts nicely with the duality, but, uh, yeah. Um, so what, what I mean, just to be clear, so uh -huh. you, have, you have this G mod B and yeah. think of G mod B as a variety. And if I do some sort of Poincaré duality, then the, the, so there, there's nothing like, uh, there, there's no grading phenomenon that depends on the rank of G. So um, the rank I would guess not. These XIs are, they correspond to minimal parabolics in some sense, right? So, yes. so, so there's a grading shift of two that corresponds to the roots. And I'm yes. wondering if that's showing up and that, that's basically Poincaré duality for each GI mod B. Uh huh. Um, yeah, so the so I, I suppressed all the gradings in this talk, but the xi's are uh, re related to this shift, whereas the yi's are uh, related to this shift. Okay, good, good, good. Thank you. That's very okay. helpful. But isn't it more like Fourier transform than Poincaré duality? So now this. It's, so that. Yeah, I, I I still don't really know what that statement means. So. I, but what I was, I mean, you can make the two compatible in the right cohomology theory, right? Fourier transforms can be made into Poincaré duality in K-theory, for example, or something like that. Oh, guys, may, may make a comment on Actually, we should, we should continue the talk and we should discuss yeah. this afterwards. Okay. You ready to begin? Okay. Yeah, I have a, a bunch to get through, so let's do it. Right, so I need to tell you what this curved causal duality is. And this is a story um, that goes back to, well, let me tell you first about classical causal duality. That relates to graded algebras. The most classical case is uh, Bailinson, Gelfand, Gelfand, relating a symmetric algebra and an exterior algebra, suitably graded. And they say there's a triangulate equivalence between um, pieces of uh, derived categories of graded modules for each one. There's a more recent framework for this causal duality due to, due to Keller and Lefebvre Hasegawa, where you replace the dual algebra by a co-algebra. So in this theory, the input is a triple consisting of an algebra A, a DG algebra A, DG co-algebra C, and what's called a twisting co-chain relating these two. The most important thing is that uh, a twisting co-chain satisfies this, it's some sort of Cartan-Maurer equation. Whenever you have this structure, you can take a DGA module, a DGC co-module, and tensor them together 
and put some additional differential on it using this twisting co-chain to make that into a complex itself. And this is called a twisted tensor product. So in particular, you can take a C co-module and tensor with A to get a A module and vice versa. And this always gives you a DG adjunction. And you say that this twisting co-chain or this triple AC tau is acyclic if this adjunction induces an equivalence of certain derived categories where you have to be a little bit careful what you mean by derived category on the co-module side. But uh, if you have um, suitable finiteness conditions on uh, everything involved, then you can turn this C into uh, an algebra by taking the linear dual. Then you recover the usual uh, equivalence of derived categories that you, you have in more classical causal duality. Now, I was uh, sleeping under, under the rug, the fact that these algebras and co-algebras are assumed to be augmented. An augmentation is a DG algebra map from A to the trivial algebra K. And when you have this, you can form the reduced bar construction. This is, uh, um, you take the tensor co-algebra on the augmentation ideal, so A plus, all the tensor powers of A plus. And then you put an, uh, an additional differential on it. That's the usual thing for, uh, if you've seen bar resolution, uh, alternating sums of uh, nearby multiplications, mu. This can be given a co-algebra structure. Well, whenever you have a tensor, um, you always have a tensor co-algebra on, on anything. This doesn't use anything. A co-algebra structure is, just uh, splitting, splitting tensors into two. And this bar construction admits a twisting cochain to A, which is universal in the following sense. If you have a suitable collection of, uh, if you have a suitable class of uh, co-algebra C, then a twisting cochain from C to A is the same as the data of a DG co-algebra homomorphism from C to the bar construction of A. So you can rephrase acyclicity in terms of this uh, induced co-algebra homomorphism. You say that this is a weak equivalence uh, if uh, somehow, so I, I don't want to, to say what this is, but uh, somehow if you think of the bar construction as giving you some functorial resolution of A modules, then acyclicity is the statement you can think of as saying that you can use C instead of the bar construction. And it will also give you a resolution. Now let's think about the, the case that we care about. Here's the, what we call the Cartan triple for GL2. So now I want to consider algebras over the polynomial ring. And our algebra, the DG algebra is the causal complex as before. So everything is R linear and this doesn't have an augmentation. What it does have is a splitting of the unit. So since we're working over R, the monoidal identity in the category of R modules is R. And so the augmentation must be a map from K to R, not to the base field K. But this map is not closed. So this map just kills the uh, odd variables theta one and theta two. So this is not an augmentation. And in that setting, Paul Zitelsky has a, um, well, he, he has a, a bunch of related papers, but uh, in a, a paper titled, whose title starts with two kinds of derived categories. Uh, he explains that if you don't have an augmentation, you can still have a causal duality theory by allowing a curvature on the co-algebra side. So associated to uh, a DG algebra, now you have some sort of curved bar construction. And uh, otherwise the story goes through, but now you allow CDG or curved DG co-algebras, okay? And all of the story is being generalized by Berke. He has a, an ongoing project to generalize this to a commutative base ring. And this example is uh, actually a specific case of one of the running examples that Berke has. So the Cartan triple for us consists 
of uh, the algebra is the causal complex. The dual, the coalgebra, is the thing that it's dual to the R check we saw in the AMRW definition of free monogamy complexes. And now it's a divided powers coalgebra in two variables. It's called a gamma one, gamma two, still linear over R. And this is equipped with some curvature. It's exactly the thing that is dual to this curvature we saw earlier, y i x i. Okay, and then Burka says there is an acyclic twisting cochain relating this coalgebra and this algebra. Sorry, quick question, uh, yeah. Mackie. Could you go to the previous slide? So, gamma is this divided powers polynomial ring? Is that what gamma is? That's right, divided powers polynomial ring. Okay, thank you. So here's a, a picture of gamma in this rank two case. You have, uh, again, it's a bunch of copies of just R, but I've labeled them by um, powers of these gammas. So in degree two, for example, you have uh, the second divided power of gamma one, the second divided power of gamma two, and then you have gamma one, gamma two. Okay. And the statement that this is a, a causal duality relating K and uh, gamma with some curvature, you can replace, you rephrase in terms of the bar complex. So the bar complex of K is uh, something much bigger than gamma. It's the thing that always resolves any K module. And well, uh, the augmentation ideal of K has three copies of R labeled by theta one, theta two, theta one, theta two. And so the bar complex allows any tensor of those any tensor of these uh, uh, thetas and wedges of thetas. Okay, so this bar complex is a huge thing. This gamma is a much smaller thing. It has the same size as a, a R check tensor R. And you can think of this gamma as sitting inside the bar complex as uh, symmetric tensors in the theta i's. And so this curved causal duality says that you can, instead of working with the bar complex, just work with the smaller, uh, Co-algebra. Okay, so this is the main tool that we need to um, carry out our program, our dream. So just like before, we viewed K, the causal complex, as, a, as an algebra object, bold K in the triangular de Hecke category. You can do the same with a twisting cochain and the gamma. Let's call it gamma bold. Uh, this already carries some uh, curvature. Then, in this language, this is just a reinterpretation of the original definition of uh, free monogamy complexes from the AMRW. UGU consists of uh, certain curved DG module co-modules where uh, K acts on the left and gamma acts on the right. And then, well, motivated by this relation between the bar complex and gamma, you can try to replace gamma by bar. So now instead of just allowing right multiplication indexed by these uh, uh, dual variables y's, you allow higher multiplication by uh, a bunch of thetas. And here, so here's the definition of what we call a bar free monogamy complex. It's UGU, but uh, even thicker on the right hand side. And so what this is, is a type of A infinity bimodule called a type DA structure. So on the left-hand side, you just have a, a DG multiplication of, a, um, of the causal complex. Whereas on the right, I allow not only a, um, yeah, I, I, I allow a co-action of the entire bar complex of K. So this kind of structure, as I said, uh, appeared in the um, work of, of um, Lipschitz, Oswald Thurston on on border Higgard floor homology. And they actually also defined um, a pairing on these called the box tensor product. And this supplies us with a, a nice monoidal triangulated category, UGU. So this is our take, uh, our upgrade of this UGU. So here's the uh, summary of all the categories. I'm sorry, there are so many of them. This is the triangular de Hecke category. And this acts on the right of UGB. 
This was left modules over the causal complex. And, and then you have the free monogamy complex, UGU, which now you can understand as you have a, a K action on the left, a gamma coaction, gamma is the divided powers coalgebra on the right. And then this acts on the left of this because there's a, a pairing of gamma co-modules and K modules given by uh, the twisted tensor product. And even better, if you replace this gamma by the bar complex and pass to this A infinity world, then you have a monoidal triangular category which acts on the left of UGB by the box tensor product. Okay, so this is supposed to be uh, um, an upgrade of uh, the picture that we saw earlier, just had two categories, parity and tilt, acting on the right and left of UGB. Now you have whole triangular categories acting on this triangular category UGB. And using um, the acyclicity of uh, this Cartan triple, this uh, causal duality between K and gamma, we, we show that um, these two categories of uh, free monogamy complexes are equivalent. So let me return a little bit to the original definition of uh, free monogamy complexes. I said there was some difficulty in understanding the, uh, the monoidal structure, this hat star. Well, now in this new language, we, can, we have a nice interpretation for it. If UGU is K module, gamma co-module, then I can pair the K and gamma using the twisting co-chain between them. And that gives you uh, a candidate for a monoidal structure, at least a bifunctor between these two on, on this category. And this is closely related to the hat star uh, that was introduced in AMRW. But this doesn't give you a, um, a monoidal structure on the entire category, it turns out. So as I said before, whenever you have a twisting co-chain, you have a, an adjunction between K modules and gamma co-modules given by twisted tensor product. And uh, so you can think of kind of this as a, as a resolution. You can take a K module, you can tensor with gamma to get to a, a, a gamma module, and then you can come back by tensoring with K to get a K module. If gamma is instead the bar resolution, then, then this really is the, the uh, bar resolution of a K-module. But now this is some smaller resolution. And um, what you need is that this endofunctor on K-modules is, well, it doesn't have to be a resolution, but I ask that it's a, an, an idempotent up to homotopy. So in, I, I said with Matt, I have a, a series of papers, but the first paper is just about uh, this construction, K and gamma. And whenever you have this property called cohomological idempotence, which is exactly what I just said, you have a monoidal category of module co-modules and some subcategory of uh, uh, um, the whole category of module co-modules. So in this way, we actually recover the, uh, the main result of AMRW that you have a, a monoidal category of um, something you can think of as sheaves on UGU. And it avoids all, all the calculations that went into that paper. So now I can state the, um, the main result that I promised. It's a Langlands reconstruction. So here's the triangulated Hecke category associated to the Langlands dual G check. Here is our new version of UGU, which is monoidal triangulated. And we claim that these are equivalent as monoidal triangulated categories. And the proof is basically, well, you already have some additive version of this from previous work. And to upgrade this to a triangular version, you just need to compare uh, the categories involved. 
you can compare uh, the UGU category that showed up in AMRW with this new one because they are equivalent by uh, the idea theorem I stated. So again, what this is saying is that G and G check have their uh, own um, triangulated Hecke categories, but they know each other. And in fact, they know each other in a really striking way. This D mix B check, G check, B check is equivalent to this Freeman genomic category associated to G. And that's the same as the right category of bimodules in IK category over a, a certain algebra object, the causal complex. So I have some um, more pages, but this is uh, not strictly speaking necessary. So maybe let me end my talk now and open up the questions. I probably went uh, a little too fast. Great. Mackie, my first question is, why don't you have a thicker double slash on the left? <laughs> oh yeah, well, so the, um, so if you see this, um, all the categories, the slash on the, the, the fat slash on the left here is uh, just supposed to indicate that you use the causal resolution here. There's a richer DG structure than this version, complex observable modules. Uh, and that's the same here also in this, um, uh, what we call, so in this, um, type DA by modules. On the left, you really do have uh, just a, an action of the causal complex. Oh, and so it's only type on the right. AA would be double slash, that's double right. slash. I exactly, see. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's right. So there, there are actually, um, um, I, I, I don't know if we'll actually say this explicit, explicitly in our paper, but, but there are also many other different ways of thinking about this category UGU. You can do type AA, uh, type DD maybe um, is uh, involves um, trickier finiteness issues, but um, yeah, you can do type AD, type AA, and those are all different DG models, but uh, equivalent up to homotopy. And you can also use K and gamma, or K and uh, gamma and gamma, uh, K and gamma. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have a factor of like taking closure in a sense, like? So maybe U G U closure in what sense? Like like when you compute the invariance of links, you first compute uh, that. that. Like so closing up a braid. Oh, something like Cauchy's homology. Yeah. So so yeah. So that would be yeah. So this whole construction is um, um very general. So you can start with the category of Zorgo bimodules, and run this story and get this whole picture. Or you can, um, instead of starting with Zorgo bimodules, you can say, take the category of Zorgo bimodules and their, their cohomological shifts. And um, instead of HOM, use X. So, so now you already have a, um, uh, the Hoshio grading. And you can apply this whole machinery to that setting also. Um, so, uh, Yes, somehow the, the odd variables, yeah, the odd variables showing up in this story, the causal complex showing up here is, uh, is a different one from um, the Hoshio variables. Okay. And you can do both, they're, they're independent. I got a bit confused about, so, so which, which parts of your statements actually work on the DG level and at which point do you really need to pass to triangulated categories for for things to be monoidal and things to be every I mean for everything to work right okay so <laughs> sorry if that's a, I mean I sort of I no, have no. to admit I got a bit lost in the in the many many categories but yes I know somehow, I mean they're all triangulated categories they should all have DG models um, and and yeah, so, so which bits work at DG level and which simply don't? Because you said in the beginning that some, some things didn't work at DG level, like right, something yeah. definable at DG level or something. 
yes, let me find a good slide. And maybe I just, um, yes, maybe I, I just use this uh, um, last slide. So, um, yeah, it, okay, let, let, let me go back. If I if I if I'm only looking at um, BG, um, yeah. So on the BGB side, this is totally fine at the DG level. You have a really have a DG monoidal category. This yeah. you can really think of as just complexes of Zola by module. So that's fine. Yeah. Okay. The problem is whenever you pass to uh, UGU, um, either with a, a very fat back slash or just with a fat slash. Mm -hmm. Both of those, you, you really need to pass to homotopy category. Um, okay. Either you have a problem with um, things not being unital only up to homotopy, or uh, uh, the monoidal product not being a bifunctor but only okay. up to homotopy. Okay. Yeah. Um, and this is, you also don't see this issue. Are you, um, ah, yeah. Right. Um, and so let me, let me go back. So that's what happens in the monoidal version of causal duality. Mm -hmm. But even if you only care about this, um, this arrow in the middle relating something like the derived category of uh, category O with the, its dual, mm -hmm. um, this duality is really only constructed at the, at the triangulated level, not DG. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. Do you think um, that would have a lift and it just hasn't been done or, or do you think it's just not true at a DG level? No, I think it's just not, probably not just not true. Um, okay. So this, so it, this, this duality satisfies this weird uh, um, relation with the shift. I mean, cause of duality you always have this, this, this kind of behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it has the effect that it doesn't preserve the, the perverse heart. So, um, Oh. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't seem to be, um, okay. so as, as far as I know, there's no um, nice geometric construction of this causal duality. In the end, you have to really work with genders and relations and just construct the monoidal functor okay. somehow. Yeah. I mean, I, I either you use sort of bind modules or, or, or something else. So yeah, okay. there, there's no like um, uh, correspondence at, at least, uh, um, yeah. N nothing is known that realizes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So I have a related question. So you mentioned that the uh, composition and the product, they commute up to homotopy. So can I think of all this big construction with gamma as some kind of fixing this homotopy and fixing all the higher homotopies somehow, which fit nicely in some kind of infinity? Yeah. So um, if you, Think about how gamma and the bar complex are related. So, so gamma is just the divided powers coalgebra. So this is this, yeah, you should think of this as an action of the y's, the y variables. Mm -hmm. um, and you um, yeah, and, and so so this um, this identification of gamma with symmetric tensors inside. Uh, the bar construction works as follows. So for example, yi goes to theta i, um, and then y1, y2 goes to theta1, theta2 plus theta2, theta1. So, so the action of y1, y2 in the, um, um, in the gamma picture corresponds to the, um, it, it, it is some A infinity, it's, it's a part of the A infinity structure, A infinity multiplication on the right, but um, it's only those that act by uh, symmetric tensors in the thetas. Does that help? Yeah, a little bit. I need to think about it. And the okay. second question, so can you get like fully symmetric picture when you have R and R check and lambda and lambda check somehow? That's maybe what uh, Matt will say. I mean, um, we we can't prove it yet, okay. But he'll say something towards that. Uh, sorry, Eugene, you said R R check lambda lambda check. Yes. I, I, that oh, might uh, that, that might actually be like L M or something. Like if you if you have R lambda kills the action of R lambda check kills the action of R check. So 
I don't know. If, uh, yeah, I, I won't mention that in my talk. Anyway, we can talk later. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. It's nine, so it's probably a good time to thank the speaker again. And stick around if you want to ask Mackie some more questions. There's some chat rooms you can go to if you like.